Good evening. All honor, all power, and all glory belongs to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome this wonderful Wednesday evening. Hallelujah. We are going to have a great time again tonight in the Word of God. I hope you enjoyed yourself last week, buddy. But the hits just keep coming. Amen. So, as I always tell you, and I not even tell you, ask of you to please get your paper, your Bible, your pencil, and a glass of water so you can get fed the Word of God. Because it's going to be powerful once again. Because God is so good. So, I don't want to tarry long. I want to do what I'm up here to do, and that's my devotion. And... Help me sing this song, please. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Joy is mine. Joy is mine. Joy today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Joy today is mine. Here we go now. Peace is mine. Peace is mine. Peace today is mine. I told Satan, Get thee behind, peace today is mine. Here we go. Love is mine, love is mine, love today is mine. I told Satan to get thee behind, love today is mine. Hallelujah. I hope you have the victory. Now, if you can get your Bibles, please, and join me in reading the Word of God. I'm coming from the book of Proverbs. I'm reading from the Revised Standard, starting at chapter 10 and verse 1, going to uh, verse 9, 10. And it goes like this. A wise son makes a glad father. But a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A son who gathers in summer is prudent, but a son who sleeps in harvest bring shame. Blessings are on the head of the righteous, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The memory of the righteous is a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. The wise of heart will heed commandments, but a prating fool will come to ruin. He who walks in integrity walks securely, but he who perverts his ways will be found out. He who winks the eye causes trouble, but he who boldly reproves make peace. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And my New Testament scripture is coming from the book of James, if I'm not mistaken. Give me a second here. <laughs> yes, yes. I have it. Yes, yes, yes. Book of James. Uh, here I go. James Peter John. Okay, I'm sorry. I usually have to get right to it. James. Second letter. Okay, I'm, I'm messing up today. <laughs> Bear with me, family. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, a little thumb-tied today. 
and okay. And I'm coming from the set of John, the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And it goes like this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who is for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons. My sons, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines him who he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in a word of prayer. Precious Father, thank you once again, Father, for your grace and your mercy and your wonderful glory that you bestow upon us, Lord God. Father, we're here tonight to once again learn more about you, Father. So come in right now and be with us, Father. I ask that you also be with the man of God, Reverend Taylor, as he teaches us, Father. Bless those that are out there now watching us on Facebook and YouTube. And Father, go beyond Facebook and YouTube and send this word around the world, Lord God, so that people can be healed and delivered, Lord God, and set free. Father, uh, our hearts are heavy for those individuals that are under the bridge in Texas that came from Haiti, Father. Oh, Father, please cover them. Give them protection, Father God. Father, give them food, water, fresh water, Lord God, and help them to find their way either into the United States or back home to Haiti, Lord God. Protect them in the name of Jesus. And Father, please, Father, touch those that have lost loved ones due to COVID, Lord God. Comfort them in the name of Jesus. But Lord God, also, Father, as you go forth, we're listing up our own sick and shuttered individuals that are in the hospitals, that are home, that, that, are, that cannot make it. Lord God, I even lift up our elderly to you, Lord God. Please bless them and comfort them and give them the desires of their hearts as well. But Lord God, I even ask that you bless our, our pastors, our deacons, our ministers, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. But Father, we know that we need your presence. We need you right now. So come in and be with us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can I bring forth to you, ladies and gentlemen, the man of God who hails from the city of Chicago, Illinois. Southside! Southside! Yes! Let's give a round of applause to our own Reverend Dr. Mark Vernon Carlton Taylor! <laughs> love that song. Truly all power, all glory, and all honor belong to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are happy to be here today. Amen. Uh, I worked up with sweat dancing. Wait a minute. Daughter, cut that, cut that air conditioning up there. I, I'm sweating now. Amen. But the door is open. I had to Amen. dance my way through. That's right. All right. Put it, put it, that one, uh -huh, that one in the middle. Put it in the middle. That's it. Yes. Blow some breeze out here. Truly all power, all glory, all honor belong to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are so happy to greet you. We're here in our not unknown location. No. Amen. Every now and then I go to an unknown location. Amen. With Dick Cheney. Amen. Hope you don't have that rifle. But we are at a remote location. Here in the pastor's office. 
Amen. We want to welcome you to uh, my office. Uh, we've been trying different sites, and this site seemed to be one that was working. Uh, we are glad tonight to welcome you to our Bible study, and we're welcoming you from different sources. Uh, we thank God for YouTube, everybody here that will watch this on YouTube. We thank God for Facebook, all of you who are joining with us on Facebook, and we thank God for the telephone. Some people will call in and uh, join with us on the telephone. Uh, it's great to be alive. I congratulate you on making it to Bible study tonight. The devil does not want you to learn the word of God. The enemy does not want you to praise God. And the enemy doesn't want you to have joy and peace. The enemy does not want you to be a loving person. But the devil is a liar. And, and let the devil be a liar and let every word of God be true. So tonight we come here to welcome you to uh, our Bible study. And so we're going to bow our heads and we're going to call on God to bless us to fill us with the Holy Spirit and to be present with us as we study His Word. Lord God, we just want to say thank you, thank you that we were able tonight to walk through the open door. God, we want to say thank you that we're able to sit down and study Your Word of God. Now, God, fill us with the Holy Spirit. God, break off all the shackles that the day has tried to place on us, shackles of discouragement, shackles of tiredness, shackles of physical sickness shackles of lethargy shackles maybe of even spiritual coldness or unbelief lord help us to shake all of that off and come to you right now lord asking you to feed us with bread from heaven lord your word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path so take over right now and give us your divine word god will thank you and will praise you and will give you the glory this is our prayer in the name that's above every name, the mighty and matchless name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. God's people said, Amen. 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 And so let us turn our attention to our text. We have been in uh, 1 Timothy, and tonight I want to go back. I've been switching up a little bit. I usually, for years, I've done my Bible study in the RSV, but I have many other Bibles here. I have the Easy to Read Bible here. I have the Christian Standard Bible here. Uh, and I uh, have the RSV, of course. Uh, but tonight, allow me to go to the NIV. The NIV uh, tonight. And so I want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I want to read uh, down to verse 7. We won't, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we won't cover all of these verses, but I do want to mention them. 1 Timothy chapter 2 from the New International Version. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful, quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases mm, God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. But, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. And a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's bow our head as you take your seats. Father God, we just want to say thank you for another night. Now, Lord, I just want to ask you, Lord, to help me to be a, a true and faithful teacher of the gospel as the apostle was. Bless this lesson. Give us, Lord, what you want us to have. In my name and the name of Jesus, we pray for his sake. Amen. 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 All right. Um, now, we've been talking for a couple of weeks about prioritizing prayer pleases God. How's the sound? Let us know out there if you can hear me good, if the sound is good. Priorita prioritizing prayer pleases God. This has been our uh, theme for the last couple of weeks and I'm so excited because I just love the idea of pleasing God. Successful relationships are predicated 
upon uh, meeting people's needs. And if you want to be successful in a relationship, ask yourself, do I please this person? And so uh, this is true on the human scale. Matter of fact, one of the most under taught and under focused scriptures is in 1 Corinthians 7, where it says an unmarried wife wants to please her husband and an unmarried, no, I'm sorry, let me get it right. A married man wants to please his wife uh, and that uh, a married woman wants to please her husband. If someone is unmarried, they have time to give all of their attention to God. They can be totally devoted. When you get married, you have to be devoted to pleasing your marital partner. That's the key to successful relationship according to 1 Corinthians uh, 7. I don't care who you hear get divorced. Oh, they were together 40 years and they got divorced. I don't care what the society says. Uh, the Bible says, I, I believe, uh, Matthew 8, uh, 7, no, 8 maybe, that men uh, and women get divorced because of hardness of heart. And the hardness of heart starts when you stop pleasing your partner. Now, this is true in marriage, it's true in friendships, it's true in a work relation. If you're in a job where they're just, just abusing you, you might have to leave. Then how much more so true is it about God? When we do not please God, our relationship with God is in danger. When we do not please God, <clears throat> our relationship with God is in trouble. And so one of the things that we should uh, aspire to, we should make it our aim as the Bible said, Paul says, we make it our aim to please Him, 2 Corinthians 5. That should be our goal. That should be our aim. Now, honestly, we don't hit this goal all the time, but that's what we should be aiming for. Do I please God? And many times, you know, the truth of the matter is we might find we're not pleasing God. But thank God for repentance. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank God for conviction. Thank God for grace. <laughs> then we can get it right with God and we can have another chance to please Him. Uh, and then we find from our study here is that when we put God first in prayer, it pleases God. Uh, this teaches us not to <coughs> pray, excuse me, <coughs> not to pray uh, because we feel like praying. We must have a schedule of prayer. If our prayer is going to be prioritizing prayer, if it's going to be powerful prayer, it's going to be life-changing prayer. We have to uh, pray without ceasing. The only way to do that is to have a schedule. When we wake up in the morning, we should pray the seven things that we've been taught in this church to pray. You can uh, write us and I'll, I'll give you those things. Uh, you should have a prayer period throughout the day. Uh, uh, seems like there's been a lot of accidents on the highway. I, I drove past an uh, accident today. And as I got past the car and saw what it was, I prayed, some car collapsed in the front, the wheels were all off. I prayed for the car, there was somebody in the car, I prayed for them as I came. So we should be praying throughout the day. But then we should have a period like this every day where we devote an hour to prayer and Bible study. We got to devote an hour to listening to God speak to us. An hour to calming ourselves and returning to our inheritance. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness temperance, kindness, self-control against such there is no law of fruit of the spirit, that's ours we got to return to calming ourselves down strengthening ourselves sometimes you might have a bad week I've had a very frustrating week I was trying to work on several projects didn't seem to gain ground and I really had to pray my way through because I was like oh lord <laughs> thank God for prioritizing prayer the Bible says in the book of James, the fifth chapter, is anybody in trouble? Let them pray. So when trouble comes, difficulty comes, frustration comes, we should prioritize prayer as the solution. Prayer that's done like that, prioritizing prayer, the Bible says, pleases God. Hmm, listen to what the Bible said. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. Whatever mess you're in, God is going to save you out of it. But you got to have that prioritizing prayer. Oh, thank you, Lord. Then, that, that was uh, verse 3. Then in verse 4, uh, it says, uh, God our Savior, and we're reminded that these divisions and verses were not part of the original text. They were put in by scribes and priests later to make the text more manageable. So there's no gap between 3 and 4. 
and it should read, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. A lot of times people say, what is the will of God? What does God want? We shouldn't think of this as, you know, when we reach forks in the road and we could go left or right. The will of God is a much broader question. And we must understand the broad meaning of the will of God so we can understand what to do when we get to a fork in the road. Because one part, one fork might lead you to something outside of God's larger, broader will. Another road might be detrimental to God's larger and broader will. So we have to understand this broad statement of the will of God. What is the will of God, Pastor Taylor? What does God want? God wants everyone to be saved. Mm -hmm. Who wants all people to be saved? Everybody you pass today. Every good person, every bad person, every well-dressed person, every poorly-dressed person, every black person, every white person, every Asian person, every rich person, every poor person in uniform or out of uniform, God wants everybody to be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. What does it mean to be saved? To be saved means to recognize your sinfulness, to repent Turn around and ask the Lord to come into your heart. And to be saved means really you make Jesus now the controller of your life. You make Jesus now the main thing in your life. You make Jesus now uh, your go-to for strength, your go-to for help, but also your go-to for instruction. You make Jesus the center of your joy. You walk with Jesus and Jesus walks with you. That's what salvation is. Salvation is the greatest thing in the world. Hallelujah. And when we're saved, glory be to God, we come to walk in God's light and we come to understand who God is. So, what does God want? God wants everybody to be saved. <clears throat> everybody. Every Muslim? Yes, everybody. Every Jewish person? Yes, everybody. Every spiritualist? Yes. Every uh, black Hebrew, yes. God wants everybody to be saved. Now, this is very important. Because it means we should treat people a certain way. Because this is a candidate for salvation. This is very important. It means we shouldn't break on that person we're about to break on. Mm, we're about to load it up and give it to them. <laughs> Lord says, hold on, I want this person to be saved. People that we might have given up on, you know, we see homeless people, we see mentally ill people, we say, oh, I don't know what help there is for them. God wants them to be saved. Mm. And God can save them. And you said something about the deep and profound nature of God and God's character, that God's will that is expressed in the creation in the billions of universes, the billions of galaxies, the billions of planets, that in the midst of all of that, God wants people to be saved. And also, this should make us more concerned to talk about Jesus more. You know, our society mocks Jesus. I hear people say, I'm gonna have a come to Jesus meeting. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be joking like that because Jesus shouldn't be a joke to you. Mm -hmm. You just say, I got to have a point of me. Mm -hmm. Joke with Jesus. Joke about Jesus. Can I go ahead and talk? Come on, help yourself. You show reverence to Jesus. And you tell people, yes, you need Jesus. Not as a joke. Not as something that makes light of their faith that's supposed to be the main thing in your life. And there's many ways of telling somebody they need Jesus. Sometimes you just ask them, can I pray for you? Sometimes the thing I like to do, I like to say, God bless you. People be like, what? God, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh -huh. And I said, sometimes I just say, thank you, Jesus. Sometimes I just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. And a lot of times people say, yes. <laughs> they be like, yes. A religious guy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, a religious guy. But sometimes when you talk to people, you got to tell them who Jesus is. Which means you have to know who Jesus is. You have to tell them what Jesus can do. 
which means you have to know what Jesus can do. You have to tell him uh, uh, what the Word says about Jesus, which means you have to know what the Word says about Jesus. That's why I'm glad you're here tonight, because God can change things around. God can change people around. God can change us around. God changed me around. Hallelujah. My day, my day uh, at 7.30 is going much better than it did at 10.30. 10.30 look rough. But I say I was praying. But the Lord turned it around. I see salvation just in how God deals with me in the pattern of the day. I see salvation in God changing my mindset. Sometimes I'm just like, oh boy, so many problems. And the Lord says, work your way through. Hallelujah. I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Work your way through. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Keep on stepping. All your help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Keep on going. Nothing is too hard for God. All right? And so all of this is part of salvation. And so God's will is that everyone be saved. But not only that. Everyone be saved, the word says, and come to a knowledge of the truth. So what is God's will? God's will is that everyone know the truth. God's will is that everyone be saved. And that's why you and I that know the truth, we have to be serious about sharing the truth. Never be uh, ashamed to ask people, can I pray for you? And pray to them in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's power in that name. Never be hesitant about uh, talking about your happy moments that God has made you happy. Never hesitate to tell your testimony. If it had not been for the Lord, oh my God, who was on my side, then where would I be? Don't hesitate. Share that frequently. Share that all the time. Because it will help people to do what? Come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, Pilate asked Jesus the question, what is truth? And that's, that's, uh, I think in the Gospel of John, he asked him that question. And that's a good question for a politician because most politicians tell a lot of lies. And so you can see Pilate struggling, talking with Jesus. He was struggling with his political career, struggling with his political reality, struggling with his wife. His wife said, don't have nothing to do with that man. Don't you do anything to that man. I dreamed about him all night, tossing and turning. Pilate himself said, I find no fault in him. Pilate himself wanted to wash his hands of the matter, but pressured by the public. And that's why I don't ever follow people. Um, I was reading a book by the great historian Martin Marty and he said that in the 50's somebody was saying that in a democracy the voice of the people is the voice of God no ain't, none, ain't no voice of God but God because the people can be dead wrong 75 million people thought Donald Trump should be the president again. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me nothing about people. Okay? The Bible said when Moses came off the mountain, the people had rose up to feast and sat down to play. Or rose up to play and sat down to feast. One of those two. They had all forgot about God. God just brought them through the Red Sea. They was like, party. Drinking, carousing, and acting crazy. Where is this Moses? He gone. Let's get it on. Okay? Just that quick. Don't tell me about people. If you follow people, you're on your way to a hell. A burning hell. Uh-uh, don't follow people. What did Jesus say? It's two roads. The road that leads to life, there's few people on it, it's narrow and it's hard. The road that leads to death is big, it's a highway, everybody's on it. The voice of the people cannot be the voice of God. There is only one voice of God, and that's the voice of God. But that statement is a testament to how strong human influence can be on other people. But here we are as Christians with a mandate to fulfill. That is to give people a knowledge of the truth. And listen, don't feel like, well, I ain't Reverend Taylor. I ain't going to be telling people about Jesus. It ain't about being a church officer. It's about being a Christian, a faithful Christian. It's not about being uh, a preacher. I ain't no preacher. No, but if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be a witness. 
It's not about even knowing every scripture by heart or even being good at talking about God. It's about having faith enough to do God's will. And, and, and I mean, step away from thinking about yourself for a moment and grasp this scripture. What is God's will? That everybody be saved. What is God's will? That everybody comes to the knowledge of the truth. God has put you in a certain place at a certain time around certain people to work his will. And what's his will? That everybody be saved. That everybody come to the knowledge of the truth. The people around you, even the people that make you sick, sometimes especially the people that make you sick, have been put there by God so that you might influence them to come to those two pillars of God's will, that everybody be saved and that everyone come to a knowledge of the truth. Philosophers question, the, 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 the politician raised the question in Pilate, the philosophers from Socrates on, the Greek philosophers, the ancient Egyptian philosophers, they raised the question, what is truth? And the Bible gives some answers and some of these answers, I think, uh, these verses we should memorize. I would encourage you, if you want to be a good witness, to memorize the Gospel of John, verse 14 and 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I say this all the time at funerals because I'm doing what? I'm witnessing. I want people to know Jesus is the truth. I want people to know that your day is coming. You got to die. Given unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. Your day is coming. But in Jesus, there is eternal life. There's a resurrection from the dead. There's a promise of a new spiritual body. And a hereafter where we dwell in a new heaven and a new earth. And so, I want everyone to memorize John 14 and 6. I am the way. Here's Jesus making an I am statement. I just talked about that Sunday. These I am statements call on the nature of God. They call out the power of God. They call out the creative power of God. And from the Lord Jesus, we learn to make I am statements. Sometimes you just got to say, I am not going to be defeated. I am not going to stay where I am right now. I am not going to let this thing overwhelm me. Hey, Lord, you got to make I am statements just as the Lord makes an I am statement in John 14 and 6. I am what? The way. I'm, he didn't say a way. I'm going to come to that later. He said, I am the way. The truth, not a truth, I'm the truth, and the life. Hallelujah, I'm exclusive. No man comes to the Father but by me. The Bible answers the politician and the philosopher's question, what is true? Not only in John 14 and 6, but in John 1 and 17. For the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I love it. Hallelujah. Moses was great. Moses gave the law. But there come one that's greater than Moses. Hallelujah. Moses brought the law. But what's greater than the law? Grace. What's greater than the law? Truth. Moses brought the law. Great. Hallelujah. But greater than Moses is the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. The law came through Moses. But grace and truth. Grace. You being God's favorite. Grace, God giving you the hookup, the divine hookup. Grace, you get more than what you deserve. Grace, God giving you strength when your strength is run out. Grace, God lifting you up when other people put you down. Grace, God giving you opportunities when you've messed up so many opportunities. God giving you yet another opportunity. What's grace? Grace is God being with you in your pain and your toil and your frustration. That came through Jesus Christ. Truth came through Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Truth came through Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about Jesus, we bring it in grace and truth to people all around us. The philosopher's question, the politician's question, what is truth, is answered in many places in the Bible. But I want to lift up one more scripture. 1 Timothy 3 and 15. Right where we are, 1 Timothy. Let me read this to you. 1 Timothy 3 and 15. I'm reading from the... Uh, new International Version. Uh, let me read 14 so it makes sense. 14 says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you that I am writing you these instructions so that this is 15. If I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Pillar and foundation of the truth. 
Uh, a lot of people say the church is this, the church is that. I read some on my Facebook page says no need to go into church if you're gonna be lying and evil and uh, hypocritical. No, that's wrong. You need to bring your lying and hypocritical and evil but to church. So you need to sit yourself right down so something can touch you. Maybe a song, a scripture, a prayer. Uh, don't stop coming to church because you're corrupt. Because we don't come to church because we're perfect. We come to church. This verse tells us that the church is the church of the living God. This is God's church. And this ain't my church. Okay. I'm not the angel of this house. All right. I'm just... <laughs> The attorney general, Tisha James, used to come by the church. She would say, oh, I give honor to the angel of this house. And I would start laughing. If you know me, you know I'm not an angel. All right? I'm not a devil, but I'm not an angel. Somebody in here shaking their head. Don't be shaking your head. Amen. I'm not an angel. Amen. I'm the pastor. Amen. All right? Angels are flying around invisible. All right? Now, I have a protective role over this house. There's no doubt. When the Bible says in Revelation, the angel of the church, it ain't talking about the pastor. Talking about an angel. There's angels that defend open door. Amen. Amen. From a lot of things spiritually. Yes. Thank God. But the church, which is God's household, hallelujah. And you know, in a household, you always have division. In a household, you always have people fighting. In a household, you know, I never forget when we would be going to church on Sunday. We only have one bathroom. And if you got in there behind my mother, my sister, especially my sister, the sink was wet and there was a hot comb on the thing. And if you forgot or you were sleepy and you hit that hot comb, you got burned. Could have been electrocuted. Nobody but God. In the household, there's contention. Hallelujah. And the Bible never says people in church are perfect. But it says the church is God's household. Yes. It is the pillar. It means it holds up. It is the foundation. It means it undergird the truth of God. So there's truth in the church. No matter how many people are wrong, no matter how many people don't act like they're supposed to, when the Bible is there and the Word is there and the sacraments are there, Holy Communion, hallelujah, it is the foundation of the truth. And so people have no excuse to say don't, they don't know the truth. There's truth in the church. There's truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's truth in the Spirit of God. And God's will is that everyone know the truth. Now, uh, I want to say this. I don't spend a lot of time in this point in my life arguing with people about what they think the truth is. All right? Uh, I'm at the age where I realize I don't have unlimited time on the earth. And my time is precious. So when people come to me with another truth, I respect other truths. I respect other religions. But I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you what my Bible says. I'm going to stand on that. And what does my Bible say? Let's go to the next verse. Uh, verse 5. There is one God. For there is one God. Now, uh, recently an Episcopalian priest died. His name was Spong. I think that's how you say it. Spong. And he said, he wrote a book, famous book. Called God has many names. And his view was, where there's one God, people call him many names. Well, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one God. And if people are calling him many names, they call him the wrong thing. Now, I know this is not a popular view. And we're, we live in a postmodern period where everybody got a truth. I want to tell you my truth. All right. Uh, there's no one truth in the postmodern period. Everybody got a truth that they believe in. Uh, no, I understand that view is out there. I understand that's the postmodern view. Hallelujah. But my view is there's one God. And there's one mediator between God and humanity or mankind. The man Christ Jesus, the scripture said. There's one God. I know that's hard to defend. A lot of people don't want to stand by that. A lot of us, people saying, well, there's many gods. There's many ways to get to God. Yeah, we are sitting there nodding. That's because you don't know the scripture, or perhaps you are afraid to stand on the scripture. Mm -hmm. You ought to have a courage of your conviction, because if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you courage. You ought to have the courage of your conviction to stand on your conviction. It's one God. You don't have to fight the Muslim. 
You don't have to fight the black Hebrew. You don't have to fight the Buddhists. They say some good things sometimes. They say some true things. And you might meet one that's better than some Christians that you know. But the truth is not proven by a person's life. And it's not disproven by their failure to have a good life. All right? So don't, don't let that bother you. Don't get shaken by any of these things. Don't get, I used to get shaken when I would see religious leaders taken up in corruption. And the Lord said, you better stop getting shaken because you're going to see a lot. And I, <laughs> I stopped getting shaken. Okay? Because some people can play a role, but they can't live a role. Some people can be one thing in front of people, but they're another thing behind closed doors. There's open doors, like we sing in, in, a, in our intro, but there's closed doors too. Some people are different behind closed doors. Don't be surprised. That's been that's all throughout the Bible. But there's one God. Hallelujah. Oprah had a show, and there's a YouTube video. It always comes up on my feet. Oprah Winfrey saying, "Is Jesus the only way?" I think she was talking to Joe Osteen to somebody. And uh, I don't know what anybody, I don't know what uh, Reverend Osteen said, but the Bible says there's one God. And the Bible teaches the exclusivity of God, that he is the only God, and that Jesus is the only way. And you should embrace that and not worry about what people are going to think about you. Not worry about what people say. And not worry about fighting people to knock them over the head. Unless they get a revelation that Jesus is God, unless they get a revelation about truth, they won't be convinced. Yes, you should defend the faith. Yes, you should, you should try to educate people. But uh, people are really converted by a spiritual revelation, not just a flow of information. I found this out. And so when Oprah says, is Jesus the only way? We have to embrace what I call today the scandal of Christianity. What is the scandal of Christianity? That Jesus is the only way. That's scandalous. That's unheard of. But that's our belief. What is the scandal of Christianity? That Jesus is God. These are things people like Oprah don't want to hear. Because Oprah is a universalist. Oprah likes to come to church and clap. She likes to uh, come in and get a spiritual feeling. She likes to make movies about churches where you see all the corruption in the church. But the reality of God, the reality of the divine life, you will never see in somebody like Oprah because she's promoting another religion. I'm a pastor of Protestant Christianity. Oprah is a pastor of universalism. And I'm not saying I hate Oprah. I'm not trying to jump on Oprah. I'm just telling you her spiritual doctrine ain't mine. Oprah might do something that I like. She might have a show that I like. I liked her in, um, what was that movie? Um, Color Purple. <laughs> she thought, thought Oprah was, she was great at Color Purple. All right. But I'm not going to abide by a doctrine that goes against the Bible. What's the biblical doctrine? It's one God. One go between, between God and man. Amen. All right? That's our doctrine. And you get power from God. You ain't going to wake up and say, Oh, I want to thank you, Allah, Buddha, uh, Zoroaster, Judah, and calling 20 gods. You wake up, you need to just have one God to call on. You get in trouble, you ain't calling 20 gods. Mm -hmm. You better learn how to call on Jesus. All right? There's one God. Don't let the universalists make you feel bad. Uh, and it's, embrace the scandal of Christianity. Jesus is the only way. Years ago, a woman wanted to marry a Muslim man. She came to me. And she said, well, I want you to do this wedding, but you have to put a, a sheet over the cross. I said, you want me to do a wedding in this church and put a sheet over the cross? She said, yeah, you have to hide all the Christian symbols. I said, we have to hide all the Christian symbols. Why? She said, because my husband is a Muslim. I said, well, why don't you, being a Christian, go into the Muslim church and tell him to put a sheet over the Koran and the sheet over everything else, a sheet over the prayer rug. And she said, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Well, why you want me to put a sheet on the cross and a sheet on the Bible? And she was somebody's daughter, some, some executive in the church, so everybody thought we had to do this. <laughs> I ain't doing that. Jesus is all I got. But Jesus is all I need. Amen. 
Hallelujah. I embrace the scandal of Jesus. That's scandalous. Hallelujah. You can't get all the benefits and the blessings without the burden. And so you want to put a sheet on something, you better put a sheet on your mind, girl. I said, you better take that stuff out of here. <laughs> and I said, I'm not doing it. We going to the deacons. I said, you go to the president. And if the deacons met, and if the deacons told me to do it, I wouldn't do it. They got to do what they're going to do. You want to fire me because I won't deny Christ? Fire me. The Lord will put me somewhere else better. That's the attitude you ought to have. I got to suffer because I'm a Christian. Suffer. Let me suffer. God ain't through with me yet. Bishop C.H. Mason, when he was called to preach, his wife told him, I don't want to be married to no preacher. You better go pray about this because if you're going to preach, I'm gone. And he went to counsel from, he went to receive counsel from his mentor, the great Baptist founder, the first president of the National Baptist Convention, Reverend E.C. Morris. It was all down there in Tennessee, Mississippi area, Arkansas area. And Reverend Morris told him, if God called you to preach, you have to preach. Let the chips fall where they may. And he wasn't Bishop Mason, he, he went home he didn't go home because uh, he went home. Yeah, he did go home. They were married. And he said, listen, I got to preach. He said, I'm gone. He said, bye. See you. Bishop Mason lived till he was, I think, 93. And he had two more wives. Amen. Beautiful wives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not at the same time. Mm -hmm. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> he had a beautiful wife. She died. God gave him another wife. Don't let nobody threaten you and bully you in adopting something that's not in the Bible and that's not the Word because they're taking away your spiritual strength. You might be bargaining away your spiritual strength. And part of your strength is realizing there's one God and one go between between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Tell Oprah to go her way. Amen. You go your way. One mediator between God and man. How much time we got? God and man. Got 15 minutes. One mediator between God and humanity. I like that word better than man because it's always men and women. A mediator is a go-between. A mediator is somebody go to one side and they say they try to get to terms for peace then they go to the other side and they work to bring the two sides together. That's called a mediator. When two people, when a, a two groups are fighting, they go into mediation. That's negotiation to solve the issue. And the Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. Now, we know that when Paul says Christ Jesus, he is saying Messiah Jesus. And it's interesting. He, what he was saying here is the God-man, Christ Jesus. What he was saying here is the divine one in the flesh, Christ Jesus. Why can Christ Jesus mediate? Because he's been a man and he knows what it is to be a man. But yet he's God, and he knows what it is to be God. And so, as the book of Hebrews says, he can, he can have pity on our flaws and our weaknesses and our failures, but yet present the demands of a just and righteous God that we conform to a high standard of righteousness. He is the one that stands between God and humanity. And why does he stand between God and humanity? Because the problem of humanity is one thing, sin. You never hear it on the news. You never hear it in secular songs. You don't even hear it in church anymore. What you hear in church now is a watered down version of the gospel designed to hook you up. It's an American way version of the gospel designed to pump you up and teach you how to get stuff. You don't need Jesus to get stuff. Just go out and try to get stuff. All right? But you don't hear sin anymore. A lot of preachers don't preach against sin because they're trying to get a big church with a lot of people that give a lot of money. And when you preach about sin, people don't want to give you any money. People don't even want to come to church. Because they don't want to hear that. They say like that famous YouTube woman, ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for no preaching about sin. But again, hallelujah, if we're going to be real, if we're going to be Christians, and again, if we're going to study the Bible, why do we need a mediator? Because there's an issue between God and humanity. What's the issue? Sin. And the reason the Messiah Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin is because he has paid the price. 
He has solved the issue of sin for humanity if they turn to him. The demands of a just God, the wrath of a just God was poured out on Jesus. Not just in his torture on the cross, but in his separation from God. He was separated from God so I don't have to be. He was separated from God so you don't have to be. He got cut off so you and I don't have to be cut off. Oh, glory be to God. Glory. And all of the terror and trauma and weight that was put on him. Hallelujah. How does the eternal creator become a dying man on the cross? How does the light of the world go dark? Mm. How does the one to keep the earth stable have the worst earth shake and rock? How did the one who's going to bring resurrection die till the dead got up out of the ground? These are mysteries of God that are expressed in the God-man, in the Messiah, Christ Jesus. Jesus solves the issue of sin for humanity and reconciles humanity back to God. He's the solution to sin. Y'all hear what I said? Yes. Jesus is the solution to sin. Did y'all hear what I said? Are y'all listening to me? He is the solution to sin. Your sin, my sin, worldwide sin. Jesus is the solution. How is he the solution? Well, number one, he satisfies the justice of God. It says right here in Timothy, he was a ransom. He became a ransom. Hallelujah. He became, the word is used, a propitiation. It was all put on him. And he became a ransom for all of humanity. Past, present, and future. He dealt with the past when he went down into the grave and preached and led a procession up into heaven. A great mass of people were converted out of hell. He deals with the present in the presentation of the true gospel. And he deals with the future in terms of the necessity of having the world be preached around the world. That's why we're on Facebook tonight because it got to go everywhere. Hallelujah. The gospel's got to go everywhere. You should be a walking gospel time bomb ready to explode somewhere. Boom. Talking about Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin. How? Not only does he satisfy the justice of God, but the principle of salvation is released in the universe. Through Jesus Christ, the principle of salvation is released in the universe. Hallelujah. Uh, whew, man, I don't have enough time to really break this down. When salvation is released in the universe, it is a restoration of the power of good. When Jesus rose from the dead, it is a sign that good will always triumph over evil. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was a sign that there is a judgment upon sin and a judgment upon death. Death will die. Sin will die. And they will die because of the righteous power of Christ that was expressed when he rose from the dead. How is Jesus the solution to the problem of sin? He unleashes the pattern of struggle in the universe. So, one of the things that Jesus did is he struggled in his ministry against sin. He struggled in his death on the cross. And he is struggling now as he lives in the saints. Struggling with evil in the world. Alright, but it lets us know when you're going to defeat sin, there's got to be a struggle. When you're going to defeat evil, there's got to be a struggle. And somebody has to be willing to sacrifice themselves. Somebody has to be willing to suffer. Oh, the other day I was thinking of Dr. Martin Luther King and how he knew, I have his picture right here, how he knew that he would be killed. But he continued. He continued to fight. And now you and I can go places. I think of uh, my other great hero. I have him right here. Minister Malcolm X. I said Minister Malcolm X. We forget he was a minister. Hallelujah. I know Malcolm was a Muslim. I'm not trying to make him a Christian. I'm not trying to make him more than he was. He would not like that. But Minister Malcolm X unleashed black love, hallelujah, in America in a very powerful way. The Black Panthers, the Black uh, Love Yourself movement that came out of the 60s was, uh, I'm going to say it was founded by Malcolm X, but he was the one that stated it 
because of his boldness in speaking black truth, because of his boldness in talking about loving black people, because of his relentless, relentless, relentless attack on white supremacy. Hallelujah. These men show us what? And there's women too. I just happen to have these two men on my desk. I'm going to get some women on my desk. But these, these men show us the pattern of sacrifice and struggle that is necessary to defeat sin. How does Jesus defeat and answer and, and become the solution to the problem of sin? Because saints get converted and saints can be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you really want to get away from sin, you have to be filled with the Spirit of God. And when people decide to give up sin, I had a friend of mine who had been sexually abused as a child. And he was prone to suicide for several years. And one day I asked him, I said, how did you come out of this? How did you get out? He said, I had a resurrection. I said, what? He said, I had a spiritual resurrection. And I said, tell me about it. He said, the Spirit of God came over me and I was brought back to life. That's how sin is defeated. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptized the church in the Spirit. And the Bible says Jesus sends the Spirit to live in those who have given their lives to Him. And He defeats the problem of sin. So He's the mediator. He's a ransom for everybody. And that's good news we can tell anybody. And it's good news you can keep for yourself. No matter what happens to you, hallelujah, you've got to mediate. No matter what happens to you, you've got uh, the salvation. You're right with God. Salvation is in the universe. And when I say salvation is in the universe, keep in mind what I said. Good is always going to triumph over evil. Good will always triumph over evil in your life. Hallelujah. If you got Jesus. You, because Jesus gives you grace. And where sin was more and more, the grace of God was even more and more. Oh, hallelujah. Where sin abound, the grace of God abound much more. And the grace comes from who? Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. And so, oh, hallelujah. This is fantastic. These verses... A lot of times Christians are intimidated by people with other gods because they have no deep knowledge of their faith. And even in our church, when I ask most people to quote scriptures, most people can't quote five. And that counts Jesus well. <laughs> and so when you don't have a knowledge of your faith and then you come to somebody like a black Hebrew who is so sure and so correct and so right, who will brook no challenge, you start thinking this must be the truth. No, this person is just thoroughly convinced. And you were thoroughly unknowing in what your own foundation is. And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because you all are in Bible study. But you all know the Bible study crowd is, is smaller than the church crowd. And almost every black church, only 10 or 20% of the people come to Bible study, if that. One of the things I thank God about is that we have so many people come to Bible study. We have more people watching us on the stream than we had when we were actually... Um, you know, meeting together in Bible study. And so I want to encourage you to continue to study, but know when I say uh, Jesus satisfied the justice of God, when I say Jesus unleashed the principle of salvation, the guarantee of the triumph of good in the resurrection, the pattern of struggle, when I say that the Holy Spirit is in the world, hallelujah, restraining sin, making people act right, know these deep truths about Jesus so you can talk about somebody. And so you'll be sure if this is why I need Jesus. Jesus guarantees good is going to win in my life. Jesus guarantees my own mistakes and failures don't have to mean that I'm doing All right. Woo! I got to stop. I got to stop because they're giving me the signal. Go to tcotld.org when we finish and give an offering. Don't, go, don't leave me yet. Don't leave till I read this list of people. Uh, Jason Jackson, Dear Dwight. Yolanda Roby, Rosa Wilkerson, Brother Douglas, Tiana Wiggins, Brother Kearney, Deacon Page, Kalisha Bernash, Head of Women's Day. Amen. I think women, Women's Exercise Saturday? Yes, it's past Saturday. No, they walk Saturday. They walk, they walk Saturday. They, they no, the Saturday is, is the church retreat. Right. The church leadership retreat. Give me that sheet. Where's that sheet? I have it right here. Bring me that sheet. Uh, Sharon Kennedy. Sharon. Wait a minute. Uh, Pam Ingram, Deacon Robinson, Diane Cumberbatch, Sharon Kennedy, Lorraine Brent, thank you, Deacon Brickhouse, Sister Kearney, Patricia Armand, Gary Prince, Trini Cook, Sister Moore, Brenda Palacios, Diane Caldwell, Yvonne Prince, Reverend and Brother Thompson, Teresa Relifor, Teresa McClurkin, Marilyn Tucker, Courtney Lyons, Karen Sullivan, Annette Lyons, Annette Peterson, Crystal Jackson, Patty McCoughton, Reverend McDonald, Marvin Doug Calloway, Marv, I check you out on your post, God bless you, man. 
stay on the battlefield. Charlotte Watson, Dakota Barnes. Oh man, what a mighty host. Let's give God a hand for this host. I want to remind everybody, Saturday we're having an in-person leadership and planning session at the church. It will start at 1 o'clock. It was at 11. We changed the time to 1 because we have a food pantry and we want people to be able to come down to the food pantry and get food. We will start at 1 o'clock. Call the church if you're coming. We're trying to get a sense. We're going to have some refreshments and uh, uh, a lunch uh, for you. So call the church if you're going to come. If you're a church leaders, all presidents, vice presidents, all officers are invited to attend. We will not let the pandemic destroy the pillar and foundation of the truth. That is the church of the open door. Thank you so much. Remember your prioritizing prayer pleases God. Remember to do the will of God. And remember these deep truths about the Lord. We're going to stop. And we're going to uh, take a break. And we're going to come back in 10 minutes. Please go to tcotld.org and give an offering a Wednesday night Bible study off. Go to tcotld, G-I-V-I-N, cash app, uh, and give to the church a Wednesday night offering. If you see the church phone number, that's a scam site. People are trying to scam the church. Mm -hmm. But listen, the Bible says don't give the devil an opportunity. So thank you all so much for being with us. Amen. And keep this lesson in your heart. And we will see you leaders Saturday at 1 p.m. God bless you. All right? Yes. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for this Bible study. Oh, God, help us to embrace these deep truths of Christ. Satisfying the justice of God. Unleashing the principle, Lord, of the victory of goodness in the universe. That's part of salvation. And, Lord, uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit and the thing that the Holy Spirit can do. Help us to unleash it in the world. In the mighty and master's name of Lord Jesus, we pray for his sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. We are out.